want to minister on to seek and save the lost. A famous phrase spoken by Jesus. Jesus said he come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I don't want to just focus on the seeking and the saving and those who are lost. I want to do it within the context of the story in which Jesus presented it. And to do that, I'm actually going to use the story that is the gospel reading in the lectionary today. So all around the world, the global church, if they're following the lectionary or paying attention to it, are going to land on the same gospel reading. There's a universality to that so that if you walk into a church, this is particularly true in, in high church environments like the Catholic church. If you walk into any given Catholic church, they're going to be preaching the same gospel reading globally because they're preaching the gospel reading of the lectionary. And so they're not going to say the same words. They're not going to maybe take the same tact or the same approach, but you're going to have the same reading. And so that lectionary is available to every Christian around the world to really see what's the global church looking at today. I've gotten to where if I'm ministering on a Sunday, I at least read it that week. I at least pay attention to it and say, okay, let's go look at the gospel reading and see what the lectionary has. What are other preachers going to be preaching on? On Sunday and I don't know why that started happening to me more this year but the last year it has and so rather than argue and fight about it I just okay maybe it's the Lord saying pay attention to something you never paid attention to before and the lectionary reading this week is the story of Zacchaeus uh, what we called when I was a kid that wee little man and the wee little man was he and he climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see I did a whole song when I was a kid well, most of you did too and he's the, he's the subject of our reading. But at the end of the Zacchaeus story, that famous statement by Jesus is, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And amazingly, the most famous part of the Zacchaeus story is not Zacchaeus. It's that quote, Jesus come to seek and save that which is lost, because most people know that quote. If you start saying Jesus came to seek and to, everyone finishes, save that which is lost. Where is that? I don't know, somewhere in the Gospels. It's in the Zacchaeus story. And what makes that particularly interesting is Zacchaeus is not the kind of guy, considering he's Jewish, considering he can trace his lineage back to Abraham, it's not the kind of guy that we instantaneously think of as lost. Now we do because we know he's a tax collector, but if you took away his occupation and you just emphasize the fact that he's circumcised, can trace his lineage back to Abraham, probably knows the Torah, sings the Psalms, we'd say, well, he's not lost. Who's lost? Oh, well, woman caught in the act of adultery. She's lost. Woman at the well, she's lost. Sinners are lost. Not people who are in the family. They're not lost. And yet, jarringly, at the end of the story, Jesus goes, the son, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost and points at Zacchaeus and even calls him a son of Abraham before calling him lost, which tells me that Jesus' idea of saving the lost might be different than our idea of saving the lost. And I would also posit this thought before we look at one text. Jesus has not died on the cross. Jesus has not raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit has not yet been poured out at Pentecost. And yet Jesus thinks he's saving lost people. So either Jesus is crazy because you can't save lost people without the cross and the resurrection, or Jesus' definition of saving the lost is different than our definition of saving the lost, and I don't think I have to explain to you which of those two I think is true. Jesus isn't crazy, and I've been wrong before. So if that's the case, then we need to reevaluate what it means to seek and to save that which is lost, and also we might need to reevaluate what it means to be saved. Because if Jesus is doing some saving and he hasn't died and he hasn't paid for anybody's sins and not one drop of blood's been shed and he hasn't descended to the dead and he hasn't risen from the grave and he hasn't ascended to the Father and been seated at the right hand of the Father ever living to make intercession for us, then how in the world is anybody getting saved? And what's it mean to be saved in light of that kind of information? The story is in Luke 19. It encompasses about the first... Well, it encompasses the first 10 verses, but that's a pretty good chunk of the 19th chapter. Before I read it, and I want to read it just top to bottom, and then we're just going to talk about Zacchaeus. One of the reasons why we're not using a screen today, of course, is that we don't have a laptop to use the screen. But honestly, we weren't using it anyway. This is one of the first sermons 
that I've done where we had access to using the screen that I didn't put anything up but scriptures because it was just one of those, obviously the Lord knew who was running the screens and knew he was going to forget the laptop. So, <laughs> so all week long, the Holy Spirit didn't give me any screens as he went, it's not going to do any good. So he knows so much. Yeah, he knows so much. So anyhow, what's incredible about that, honestly, is that all I've sensed all weekend in preparing this was know the story and speak about it. Talk about it out of your heart. And so we'll read it top to bottom and do exactly that. But I want to just watch where this goes because I really don't know. This is one of those where I know where I think it's going to go, but I don't really know. This is why I didn't prepare a bunch of stuff. So just kind of like watch where the Holy Spirit drops our feet. Jot this down in your, if you're a note taker or if you're just thinking things through or you're writing in your Bible, especially if you got a hard copy. Watch this narrative flow. Luke 17. Now, I'm not even going to read these, okay? So you don't have to look them up, but just, you can. But I'm just saying, I want to show you a narrative flow. In Luke 17, 6, Jesus tells his disciples that if you have faith, as the grain of a mustard seed, you could move. He says, you could pluck up this sycamine tree and cast it into the sea. He says that in Luke 17. Sycamine is from the same root word for sycamore. They're both only used that one time. Some scholars think there could have just been a bit of a misspelling. We're probably dealing with the same tree. So in Luke 17, two chapters before our story, Jesus brings up sycamore trees and says that if you had a... It, your quantity of faith doesn't matter. You just had a little bitty, 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 bitty bit of faith. Go pull the sycamore tree up by the root. Sycamore trees, we'll talk about them in a second, but big. Even in, the, even in the Middle East, which is a little different than the North American sycamore for sure. But massive tree. When you get Luke 18, 9, Jesus tells a parable. Notice I just moved from 17 to 18. By the way, Zacchaeus is in 19. So something's happening. You got a sycamore tree in 17. In 18.9, Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector is the one where the Pharisee comes in to pray. And he says, Lord, I am glad that I'm not like that sinner. And he points at the tax collector. Remember this? I give alms. I take care of the poor. I pay my tithe. And then on the other side of the room is the tax collector who the old King James says beats his breast, smacks himself, hits himself in angst, head down to the floor and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus turns to the crowd and says, which one you think gets mercy? And then we're all supposed to know, of course, the one that gets mercy is the one that asks for mercy. Who doesn't get mercy? The one who brags up his religious position and his societal position and his self-righteousness. And that's juxtaposed Pharisee versus tax collector. And we've, we've abused that a little bit because we've made the Pharisee always out to be a bad guy. And the reality is, is that the Pharisees would have been the biggest religious examples of piety and goodness in the days of Christ. But when you have religion and piety and goodness, sometimes you get a little full of yourself and you get a little high-minded and you get a little self-righteous. And you start to look down on people that aren't as good as you. And you start to look down on people that don't have what you have. And that's what happens to a lot of the Pharisees in Jesus' day. And the tax collector, by the way, is as bad as it gets. Because the tax collector is a guy that is employed by the Roman Empire to collect taxes on behalf of the empire from his own people. But he can collect as much as he wants as long as he can get by with it. The Roman Empire does not care how he collects the money or how much he actually takes in. He just has to pay them exactly what he agreed to. He ha it's a contract job. So the tax collector in Jesus' day would contract with the empire and say, I will give you X amount of taxes from my region. And the Roman Empire went, you're hired. Now you better come up with X amount of taxes from your region. But if you come up with 40% more than that, the Roman Empire just gets what you told them you were giving them. Guess who gets the other 40%? the really good tax collector who's just really good at intimidating people. So in some cases, they were shakedown artists. They were a little bit of the first century mafia. And they were Jewish in lands of Judaism, which made them traitors to their own people because they were basically taxing their brothers for the empire. So a tax collector, by the way, 
was as bad as it gets in the eyes of uh, a, a Hebrew. They looked at a tax collector as the lowest end of the societal totem pole, the lowest end of everything, and they were usually shunned. They were pushed aside. Then in Luke 18, 18, Jesus tells the story, Luke tells the story of the rich young ruler. And the story of the rich young ruler, the Cliff Notes version is a young man comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do? What good thing must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus, of course, says, why do you call me good? And the reason Jesus says that is, of course, because finding eternal life isn't about being good. You don't get eternal life because you're good. You get eternal life because you have an inheritance. And Jesus goes, well, hey, if you want to play that game and you want to go about being good, tell me about your goodness. How good are you? And the young man goes, well, I've kept all the commandments from the day I was born. And Jesus goes, great, good start. Now go sell everything you own, give it to the poor, come follow me. Because if you're going to come to Jesus and brag about being good, you better be ready to lay stuff down because really the only way to follow Jesus is not be good. The only way to follow Jesus is to die. So whatever you're holding on to, you better get ready to let go of. That's the message to the rich young ruler. And how's that story end? Not well for the rich young ruler. Unless you consider still being young and still being rich a good ending because he's both of those when he leaves. He's still rich because he refuses to sell any of his goods and give to the poor. He's also not a disciple of Jesus because he goes away sad because he couldn't do the one thing that Jesus asked him to do. And so Jesus makes this famous statement. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven, which has caused us all kinds of problems because camels, needles don't make any sense together. We've even come up with this idea that there was a gate over there and a camel would walk through the gate and that that gate was difficult to pass through and that to do so, camels would have to get down on their knees and crawl through their knees. That was some piece of fantasy, by the way, made up by someone trying to figure out the fact that the Greek word translated camel is one little tick off in the Greek for the Greek word that means rope. And it's really likely that what Jesus said is, it'd be easier for you to thread a needle with a rope than for a rich man to get to heaven. Which, by the way, makes way more sense than it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And so Jesus is saying to his audience, it'd be easier for you to take that rope, probably points at a rope, he's probably standing next to the water, it'd be easier for you to take that rope and stick it through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. And in that light, there's no real calisthenics you can do to get around it. Jesus just told you it's impossible. And his disciples go, well, then how are any of us going to make it? And Jesus said, well, what's impossible with men is possible with God. In other words, don't ever worry about if my father can get you home. Just get to my dad. My dad will get you home. But listen on the way. Do as the father tells you to do. Now, why have I brought all this up before Zacchaeus? You got a sycamore tree? You got a tax collector? You got a rich young ruler? And then, lo and behold, the 19th chapter of Luke opens with this story in verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through it, and a man was there named Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to him, to the place he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him, and all who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. Now, I hope that I made it abundantly clear that the narrative flow from Luke 17 through Luke 18 and into Luke 19 was setting you up for a story. Luke does this on purpose. I don't think these events necessarily happened in a row, but Luke lays them out in a row so that you won't miss the point of the Zacchaeus story. Jesus talks about a sycamore tree. Jesus in count tells a story about a tax collector, and Jesus meets a rich young ruler. And when he gets to Jericho, he finds in the middle of a sycamore tree, a rich tax collector. And in it says, I come to take care of rich tax collectors. I come to seek and to save that which is lost. So to me, it seems that every story leading up to the, Nick, to, to the Zacchaeus story 
is being told so that we can get to that climactic moment. This is the big moment in the movie. This is, his, this is the money shot where Jesus goes, here's why I'm here to seek and save that which is lost. I'm here for all of those sycamore trees. I'm here for all of those tax collectors. I'm here for all of those rich young rulers. I'm here for the Zac Zacchaeus. It's just all of them wrapped in one story. And so if we can get to the bottom of that, we might be able to see what it means to say he come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so as we break it down, I want to try to give some ideas. Just jotted down some thoughts of what I've heard this could mean over the years and some things that I've seen over the years of what I think the Zacchaeus story might be trying to tell us. Um, I'm not trying to pitch it as these are right, and I'm not trying to pitch it as if I dis disagree with them. I just think there are, you know, in the secular vernacular, we go there, two, there are um, more than two ways to skin a cat or whatever. You know, I always wondered why the cat was involved and who skins one. It seemed weird to me, but I mean, whatever. I guess supposedly that, I think it had to do with catfish, not cats, but you know, whatever. Um, anyhow, uh, which by the way, there would be more than two ways to skin a catfish and none of them are fun. Um, I don't even know why, why that's in there now, but it's there. Um, anyway, there's more than one way to see the story. There's more than two ways to see the story. Doesn't mean they're right, doesn't mean they're wrong, but, but here's what I do think about studying the Bible. I, I think one of the things that we, a couple of things we, mistakes we make is, one, we say stuff's clear. So people go, the Bible clearly says. And I say, how clear is it since it wasn't written in English? So, you know, maybe start over with it clearly says, because they didn't write it in English, so... <laughs> You're at, least a, you're at least one language off from where it started, and you're a couple, you know, like millennium from where they laid it down. So clear is probably the last word you should use to describe what it says. So, so maybe we get rid of that. The other thing is, here's what this story means. Stay away from that. Stay away from, here's what this story means. And let me tell you why you stay away from that. Because you're not everybody. And the story means all kinds of stuff because there's all kinds of people. And you're only in one spot in your life at, at any given moment. You don't get to live, you don't get to be the you from 10 years ago today. You're the you today. And you don't get to be the you from tomorrow today. You're preparing the you of tomorrow, but you're only the you right now. And guess what? What the story says to you right now is not what it said to you 10 years ago. And it's not what it's gonna say to you next week maybe. But it's probably definitely not what it's going to say to you in 10 years. So the moment you know what it means, you're really just saying, here's what it means right now. This is my spot in the journey. It's not where I was yesterday. It's not where I'll be tomorrow. So maybe we avoid that this is what it means. Instead, we say, there's some value in seeing the story this way. There's some value in seeing the story this way. Oh, by the way, you could even say this about this story. Oh, here's another thing that's possible. Here's how the Hebrews thought about this. Here's how we used to teach it in the Dark Ages. Here's how the Catholic Church says it. Here's what my Pentecostal friends think of me. And instead of going, which one's right, say, how about a little element of it meant something to the people that saw it, and that's why they laid it down. The mistake then is to feel like you've planted your flag on the proper interpretation. Everybody else is wrong. So... What I'm about to share with you on what Zacchaeus and his story might mean is in no way me planting my flag on the truth. I'm going to end up with telling you where it is for me right now. And you can take that and use that in your journey or not. But here's some thoughts. Zacchaeus climbs the tree because you've got to rise above the crowd. This is one of the first ways I ever heard this story told as a kid. Sometimes you've got to rise above the crowd because the crowd, in fact, the old King James says he couldn't see Jesus because of the press. And boy, I remember some good sermons on what's wrong with the media. Because <laughs> the Bible clearly says, because the Bible clearly says the press was the problem. See that? Press is the problem. I'll tell you what, the press is a problem today. The media of getting your way and you won't be able to see Jesus because of the press. Okay, I realize press doesn't mean what we thought press meant, but it was not a bad application if you could get out of that whole media problem and just say sometimes you got to rise above the crowd because Zacchaeus was shorter than everybody else. And sometimes if you let the world around you press you enough, crush you enough, you won't be able to see the thing that's, right, that's really right in front of you because you'll be so obsessed with the stuff going on around you that the systems of this world will cloud your vision of seeing Jesus. The stuff you're most intimately involved with will cloud your vision from seeing Jesus. Jesus. And the only way to get out of the crowd is to literally climb above it. Climb above it intellectually, 
uh, Zacchaeus climbs above it physically, but maybe you got to climb above it intellectually. You got to climb above it emotionally. You got to climb above it spiritually. You got to do what Paul says. And you've got to set your affection on things which are above, not on things which are on the earth. Because if you set your affection only on the things which are on the earth, the crowd will press you so badly that all you'll think about is working and making money and, and raising kids and going to school and building a house and building a career. And Jesus will pass right by you. And you know what? That's a pretty good application. Because sometimes we're so involved in the midst of the swelling crowd and we're so excited to be a part of the stuff that we miss that Jesus was on his way through our, our consciousness, on his way through our lives, and we missed it. And I know I've missed it more than once because I got all excited being in the crowd. I got all excited doing what I was doing. And so pretty good application. Get out of your own space and climb the closest tree you can find. And get up in the air where you can see him because maybe it means being a little lofty above the space on the earth. Because what crowds do is crowd out the individual. Crowds are plural. You can get lost in a crowd. You don't have to be individual in the crowd. You can be part of the movement. And that's easy. It's tough to be an individual, especially when you're an individual apart from the crowd. And so Zacchaeus figures out that the only way to see Jesus is to be an individual because Jesus is walking right past the crowd. But he can't walk right past the individual because he's Jesus. And Jesus doesn't walk past individuals. So if you want to be seen, get up in the tree. Stop being part of the crowd, be an individual. This is a pretty good application. Stop being part of whatever's going on around and be the individual. Bring you. Don't bring your culture. Don't just bring your race. Don't just bring the way you were raised. Don't bring the way you always saw it. Bring you. This is me. This is who I am. I lay this in front of you. Deal with me as an individual. And we all know that salvation is part corporate. That's why we're in a church. It's part corporate, but it's also part individual. It's you understanding that he loves you. Not just that he loves you and you and you, but he loves me. And the real key to understanding the love of God is not Jesus loves us, this I know. It's Jesus loves me, this I know. Because you will meet full-blown sinners that will tell you God loves everybody. But it's hard to meet a full-blown sinner that will say God loves me. Because the moment you have a revelation of God loves me, you've left the crowd and you've went into the individual and the individual finds Jesus. Because what happened on Jesus' way into Jericho is he meets blind Bartimaeus, a blind man begging outside the gate. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops, turns, leaves the crowd, comes over to the blind man. What do you want me to do for you? Blind man goes, I'd like to be able to see. Jesus goes, you got it. Boom. You're not going to get that if you stay in the blind crowd. But if you get out of the crowd, become an individual... Great application. Got ourselves a Zacchaeus sermon. You got yourself a way to rise above what's going on politically. Rise above what's going on societally. Climbing the tree is an attempt to be seen. And all people are trying to do is be seen. And the crowd got mad. Here's, a good, here's an application for the Zacchaeus story. The crowd gets mad at Zacchaeus for climbing the tree to get Jesus' attention. Because Jesus is going to come to his house. And the crowd still gets mad when people climb trees today and don't look like the rest of the crowd. Anybody that climbs a tree and looks a little different, we, we talk about them. Look at that weirdo. What's he doing? The crowd will always talk about tree climbers, but the tree climber gets Jesus' attention. So hey, I mean, if it takes that for you to understand your value and understand your worth, climb away, man. Move outside the crowd. Do what's gotta be done. Here's another thought. Sycamores have deep roots. Now, the sycamore trees we have here in North America get pretty tall. Um, they're really big around the river. Where I come from in Missouri, that was, that's a big, big tree. It's a sycamore tree. So they have a lot of river bottoms. There's a lot here in Georgia, too. Um, they're one of my favorites. I love that. The, the, the bark changes colors, peels, and leaves have this really unique pattern, a really unique color. The sycamine or the sycamore tree of Jesus' world was also one of the taller trees in their field. It would get over 30 feet tall. But it would, it would had a root system. It was a lot like the olive tree. It had a root system that would run deep and thick and that if you cut the sycamore tree off at the trunk, the roots would continue to take water and they would regrow. So it was almost impossible to get rid of that tree. You had to pull it out by the root. 
And, and so a part of the, the, the appeal to that tree is its longevity, its strength, um, the fact that it's so hard to knock down, the fact and that it grows so tall. Um, the wood was so usable and so powerful that once, as in the era of Jesus, they didn't bury people quite as much in that part of the world in caskets or coffins. Um, but it wasn't completely unusual. In fact, as, as early as the book of Genesis, we've got Joseph's bones being put in a coffin and taken out of the land of Egypt. The coffin was always, almost always made with the wood from the sycamine or the sycamore tree. And so there was a connotation of longevity that extended beyond the grave with the sycamore tree. So that, and, and for us, that stuff's kind of cool, but for that culture, that stuff meant a lot. It's kind of like numerology. So those things went, meant a lot. So the sycamore had deep roots, it grew tall, it lived long. And so it has a representation then of uh, seeking that which is strong, seeking that which is rooted in tradition, seeking that which lives beyond the grave, so that Zacchaeus is really seeking something much bigger than himself. He's not just picking a tree. He's picking a specific tree. He's picking something that's, that he can put his faith in. He's picking something he can grab hold of. It's, it's, it's grabbing the roots of things that matter whenever you have lost your way. And when you grab the roots of things that matter when you lost your way, we, we call that tradition. And when you hold on to traditions that matter, it's like climbing the sycamore tree. It's, it's the tree that lasts over the other trees. It's the way that we see to get the attention of God. Um, because Jesus, here's, here's another way. This is all, all I'm doing is laying it. These are ways you can see the Zacchaeus story. Because Jesus uses it in, in Luke 17. Remember when he said, if you just had a little bit of faith, you could pull that sycamore tree up by the roots and cast it away. What's the context of that statement? If you haven't read it lately, re go reread 17. Here's what the context is. Forgiveness. Jesus says to his disciples, you should forgive 70 times 7. Keep forgiving. And his disciples say, I'm not sure I got that kind of faith. Which I think is a pretty good answer. Right? Like, believe me, I can make you loving. How loving, Lord? Loving enough to forgive somebody 70 times. I don't think I got that kind of faith. And Jesus goes, that's okay. If you got faith the size of a mustard seed, you could pull that sycamore tree up by the roots and cast it out. And for them... The sycamine tree starts to equal their inability to forgive. And Jesus goes, I have a love for you so powerful that if you would accept it, you could pull that unforgiveness up by the roots and get rid of it. And so it represents something so big, represents something so powerful. Things that have to be out of our way in order to forgive. And here's Zacchaeus climbing that Sycamore tree, that roots run deep in our unforgiveness. A man who carries his guilt into that tree. A man who Jesus then comes and plucks us out of that. Um, here's a couple more. The tree for a Hebrew would always point to the garden. Remember a few weeks ago we did a message here called the cross as a tree? And I don't want to rehash that, but if you're watching, go watch the cross as a tree. Listen to the cross as a tree where we try to place that... Jesus is repositioning himself at Calvary as the tree of life. That the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has a snake. It, it leads us to our consciousness. The tree at the end of the Bible is everybody gets to come and eat and you get the life of God. And in the middle is the cross. And through the cross, you get to the tree of life. So for a Hebrew audience, the tree always held connotations of the garden. And here's Zacchaeus climbing the tree. And you can see Zacchaeus, like all of us, as another representative of the snake. It, that Zacchaeus goes up into that tree, it's the place of our consciousness is when we think we're making our best decision. And the only way for Jesus to defeat that is to bring us down out of that position, to take us out of the wrong tree. And so here's another example of Jesus at the base of the tree pulling Zacchaeus down out of that tree to bring us away from our own consciousness, bring us away from our own guilt, bring us away from our own past. Or maybe the tree is the cross, because that's always a good one. The tree ends up being a cross. As I showed you, the New Testament writers like to call Calvary a tree, even though there were no branches at Jesus' cross. 
They called it a, a tree because they're linking it back to the Garden of Eden. And if the tree is a cross, Jesus pulls Zacchaeus out of the tree because the cross doesn't do you any good unless Jesus goes there. And so Zacchaeus can't meet Jesus in a tree. He's got to meet Jesus at the bottom of a tree. So your suffering really doesn't make any difference for the salvation of your soul. Jesus' suffering makes a difference for the salvation of your soul. He just brings you in it with him. So you can't climb up onto the cross without Jesus. Maybe that's a part of the Zacchaeus story. But I think, plant my flag. <laughs> I actually think all that stuff's interesting. And I think it's all relevant. I think it all preaches. I think if you were going to preach this text, you know, eight weeks in a row, just go ahead and preach all of them. <laughs> Pick one every Sunday and go, maybe the tree means this. Maybe Zacchaeus' story means this. But where I see it, Zacchaeus climbs the tree. He represents everything before him. He's the rich man that won't sell his goods. He's the tax collector in the parable story. He's the unforgiving sycamore tree. He climbs the tree looking for Jesus. But at the end of the day, it's Jesus that's looking for Zacchaeus. And I think the fact that he climbs the tree is the story's way of saying he goes out of his way to look for Jesus and everyone could tell because he lifted himself above the crowd. But at the end of the story, Jesus calls him out of the tree to let him know, Zacchaeus, I come looking for you because the reality is, is that while we all think we found Jesus, the truth is, Jesus found us. So you climbed your little tree and you brought yourself and Jesus pulled you right down out of that tree and he come to your house and he ate with you in your sin because he doesn't make you clean up before he goes to Zacchaeus' house. The cleanup can come later. I'm going to go to your house and eat now. Your unprepared house, your dirty house, with all your magazines laying around, all your dirty clothes on the floor, and all the junk you haven't cleaned up, all this, you haven't got enough food for me, that's fine. I know your reputation is terrible. I'm going to go to your house anyway, because the point of this story, I think, is that I want to show you, Jesus says, I want to show you that you think you're looking for me, but the truth is, I've always been looking for you. Seeking and saving the lost is not something Jesus does as a hobby. Seeking and saving the lost is all he's ever doing. He isn't just walking through town to get from point A to point B. He's walking through town looking up in trees to see who he can find. That's Jesus looking to see who he can pull, who he can find because he's in the job of seeking and saving the lost. Listen to verse 9 and 10 again of Luke 19. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too, he too is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus is not lost in the way the woman caught in the act of adultery is lost. Zacchaeus is not lost in the way the woman at the well is lost. He's not lost in the way the centurion is lost. But he's no less lost. Because being part of understanding what lost means, I don't think has anything to do with have you said the sinner's prayer yet. Zacchaeus is lost in his own identity. He's lost in his own guilt. He's lost in his own shame. He's lost in his own way of life. And so are we oftentimes. The sad reality is, is that all of us from time to time, even after we met Jesus, are the lost. We're lost in our own little world. We're lost in our own mind. We're lost in our own guilt. We're lost in our own shame. We're lost in our possessions. And we climb our sycamore trees trying to get attention and get God or whatever. But he always comes along to show us that what happens at the end of the day is really, I've always been looking for you. I'm coming to find you in the midst of your hurting, in the midst of your lostness. The seeking and the saving, the lost. is to show us that Zacchaeus isn't lost from being an Israelite. He's a son of Abraham. He's lost from the life of God. Jesus finds you in your sin. Our response to that determines whether or not we've been found, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's easy for me to think I found Jesus. The truth is Jesus found me. But my response to Jesus finding me 
is the answer to whether or not I've been truly found. You see, there's been times in my life I think I've been found, and I've been found out by Jesus. There's other times I think I'm intentionally lost, hiding away in the crowd, not wanting to be found. How I respond to Jesus shows whether I've been found or not. What did Zacchaeus do? This is an incredible thing to me. Zacchaeus becomes the very living, breathing example of everything that the previous stories was trying to get us to see. Zacchaeus comes out of his sycamore tree. It doesn't hold him anymore. In effect, he casts it into the sea. Zacchaeus beats his breast in the temple. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Zacchaeus is the rich young ruler who's told to sell everything he has and follow Jesus. At the end of the Zacchaeus story, he says, Lord, if I've wronged anybody, I want to pay him back 400%. Leviticus 6 is the Judaic law of financial restitution. Leviticus 6 says that if a Hebrew cheats another Hebrew, he is to pay him back with 20% extra. Pay him back what you stole and give him a 20% tip. Zacchaeus is the only time in the New Testament the law of Jewish restitution is ever invoked. And he blasts right past 20% and goes all the way to 400. I don't think what we're supposed to take from that is that God's asking for you to restitute, to, to give a restitution 400%. I think he's trying to show you that the law is measly with love. <laughs> the law teaches us to love one another, but it's measly with love. Pour grace and forgiveness on and watch the restitution of our lives in how we treat our... Show me someone who's been truly freed by Jesus and they won't squabble with how much God asks from them. They won't squabble with what it is they're expected to give back in this world. I'm not a 20% giver. I become a 400% giver. And, I, and that has nothing to do with money. It has to do with the restitution of living my life in a manner in which I know I was lost, but I have been found. 400% is ridiculous. I like to say grace is ridiculous. And the response to knowing I'm loved is truly ridiculous. If I truly know it, when Jesus comes to seek and to save that which is lost, that leads us to our final thought. How does he do it? And he hasn't died on the cross and he hasn't raised from the dead and he hasn't had the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost. He hasn't ascended to the Father. Because what we're calling salvation is when people pray a prayer and believe that Jesus died at Calvary for their sins and rose from the dead and they accept him as their personal Lord and Savior. But for God, salvation has less to do with praying a specific prayer and it has more to do with receiving love and giving it back. How do we know Zacchaeus was even saved? Well, you go, well, we know he was saved because Jesus said he was. No, we know he was saved because when he come down out of the tree and met Jesus, he went, okay, if I've cheated anybody, they can have 400%, man. I'm done with that way of life. And Jesus goes, this guy, <laughs> this guy right here came out of that tree and walked into salvation. And this is what salvation looks like. Salvation isn't just the praying of a prayer. Salvation isn't just a one-time event. Two steps, three steps, four steps, eight steps, get baptized, come to a class, get a little Bible, a little certificate hanging on your wall, and now you're saved. Salvation is what do you do with the Jesus you come down out of the tree to meet? And when you come down out of the tree and you meet Jesus, you go back out into the world. And you know why we're lost? Because we think salvation was praying a prayer. We think it was praying this little repeat after me and get dunked and that's salvation. And I'm not saying they're not saved in the sense of understanding Christ, but true salvation is salvation from self. It's from all the junk we hold on to and we do this to. And I've preached this to you before over and again, but saved from this. And what is Zacchaeus? He is the rich young ruler. He is the publican of the parable of the publican. He lives in the tree of the sycamore. He is unforgiving. He's all of the junk two chapters try to tell you about. And you get to the end of the story and he lets it go. And Jesus goes, this is why I'm on the earth. You could even say, oh, I'm going to say it. You just think about it. You could even say that Jesus in this moment doesn't say, I'm not on the earth to die on a cross and raise from the dead. The son of man came to do this right here transform lives into people that will pay restitution through love. 
not pull their wallets out and buy the kingdom. They'll pay the world back. Maybe it's why in Romans chapter 1, Paul goes, I have a debt of love to the strangers and the barbarians. And then later in Romans, he goes, Owe no man anything except what? Love. Paul got it. He went, you know what our restitution is? You know what's proof that we are saved? We lay all the baggage down. We lay the stuff we're holding on to down. We get out of our tree. We meet Jesus in the midst of our sin. And it's in that moment that's what salvation is. So I think he come to seek and save the lost. You know where he's doing his work to save? In his kids. The cross took care of the sin problem for the whole world. See, he don't have to walk around knocking on doors in the neighborhood and trying to take people's sins away. Please, I'm, I'm landing with this. This is, this is the spot. This is where you get to either swing and miss or hit the homer. And I'm, I'm planning on drilling it, all right? Jesus does not have to walk around the neighborhood and sternly knocking on doors going, can I take your sins away? Can I take your sins away? He's already died on the cross. He already did the sin problem. Sin, sin debt's paid. What did he come to do? I come to seek out and save all the Zacchaeuses of the world. They don't even know they're lost. They don't even know they're lost. But they're, oh, no, no, no. They're not, it's not a theological thing. They're lost from the love of the Father. They don't know what's been done on their behalf. I come to seek and save the lost. I think he would start at his church because we got all the theology of salvation and none of the practice. So he would come to his church and go, if you come down out of your tree and you meet me, something's got to give. And the thing that gives is the evidence of salvation. That's the evidence that that salvation is living out in you. Seeking and saving that which is lost. To me, no longer do I think Jesus come to seek and save that which is lost means Jesus is out here looking for drug addicts and alcoholics. No. Here's how I live. Here's how I've been living my life. When Jesus comes to seek and save the lost, he's talking about me. Because I've been lost more than once to my true identity. And all i got to do is turn to Jesus. And Jesus goes, today, salvation has come to this house. And, and to double down on it, Jesus says, he's already a son of Abraham. By your standards, he's already saved. Well, if he's not, what about you? Seeking and saving the lost is those of us lost to who we really are. This is the mission of Jesus. And I think we ought to participate in his mission. I really do. I think we ought to be participating in the mission of seeking and saving the lost. And I don't mean going out here and trying to figure out who sinners are. I mean introducing people to the life of God and watching the Spirit transform us. Let's pray. And let's just be honest with him. Be, be where you are. Be who you are. This is how... To me, this is what matters when you pray, is being who you are, where you are. Some of you are up a tree. It's kind of the equivalent of being up a creek without a paddle, right? You're up a tree of unforgiveness. Maybe you're up a tree because you're trying to get away from the crowd. I don't know. Some of us are the rich young ruler. Some of us are the publican in the temple. Some of us are the Pharisee. But all of us at one point or the other have been the lost. Jesus comes seeking to save. Father, thank you. Thank you for this room. Thank you for this people. Thank you for this reading today. Father, I've tried to throw out all the ideas I've ever heard about Zacchaeus today. At the end, I don't know exactly what the story is saying, but I know a whole bunch of stuff I think it's saying to me. So I don't know what it's saying to every person in this room or the people that will watch or listen, but I know the Holy Spirit knows how to make that story mean something to all of us. All of us in our stature, all of us in our sin, all of us in our tree. But Father, I think the point is when we get to the end, salvation has come to this house. We thank you for that. Do the work of transforming us to get us in that place. In Jesus' name, amen.